Okay, hi everybody. It's four o'clock and time to get started on our tour. I hope you can all hear me. If you can hear me, wave. All right, very good. Um, I think you, most of you know me, but I'm Lois Fraser, president of the Harbor Ridge Birding Society. And I just wanna welcome you all to this tour. So glad that you're here. And um, we're gonna get started with everything in just a couple minutes, but I wanted to just share a couple of housekeeping things first. Um, one is when you all joined the meeting today, um, you were automatically muted. And we're just gonna ask that you stay muted throughout this. Um, unless you're asking a question during the question and answer session, that'll just prevent distractions and um, make sure that everybody can hear what's going on. Um, and then when the time comes, if you do need to unmute yourself, the easiest way to do that is by just- well, Click the mute again, doesn't that unmute it? Well, you can click the mute again. Mute to unmute. But, yeah, we're gonna ask you to click it again and mute yourselves one more time. But the easiest way to unmute is to just hold down your space bar while you're talking. So um, just put yourselves on mute, leave yourselves there and um, we're good to go. So if you're not already muted, please do that now. Um, also throughout this, if you'd like, you can use the chat function, which you can see down at the bottom of your screen. You can put comments in there or questions and we'll make sure that we uh, get to those during the Q&A session. And today's um, tour should take about an hour in total. Um, and it should be really fun. So um, just want to start out by saying some thanks to a whole bunch of people. First of all, to all of you for joining us today. Um, this whole thing has been online, including our raffle and donations, and you all have been um, great. Your support has been fantastic, and we really appreciate that. I uh, also want to take a moment to thank the people who donated raffle prizes. Many of you are um, here online with us. Um, they're fantastic prizes, and without those, obviously, you can't really make a, a raffle work. Um, also want to thank the birders team who put this together. Uh, Brian Harrison, Catherine Sen, and Joanne Harris. They are um, a creative and dynamic group. And um, you know, when we started thinking about how do we keep our birders happy during a pandemic, um, we did a little brainstorming and came up with that idea and they ran with it and have made it happen. And um, we really appreciate that. I also wanna give a shout out to Susie Duffy who created that raffle page for us, which was extremely helpful. And of course, last but not least, and probably most important is um, I wanna thank Treasure Coast Wildlife Center for opening their doors to us virtually today. Um, I think we've all really been looking forward to getting this kind of peek behind the curtains at what goes on in a medical facility for the care of wild animals. So um, to, to get started, I'd like to introduce a couple of people from the Treasure Coast Wildlife Center. First is Susie Nash, who is the executive director. When Brian Harrison first called her up to say, hey, would you do this for us? Uh, without a second thought, she said, of course. And um, they've been great to work with ever since. And that was before she even knew that we were thinking about throwing a fundraiser into all of this. Um, she's very passionate about what she does. I don't think the word no is in her vocabulary. So that makes her just a fabulous person to run a facility like this that has to be creative about how they do things. Um, so we're very glad to have her with us today. I'd also like to introduce Carly Batts, who is development coordinator for Treasure Coast Wildlife Center. Um, she's been extremely helpful to us in planning this tour and um, she told me that before becoming um, development coordinator, she'd been a, a volunteer at Treasure Coast Wildlife Center since she was a kid. So obviously she has the passion too. And she'll be with us throughout the tour, but you may not always see her because she's going to be behind the camera for much of it. All right. That said, I would like to turn it over at this point to Susie Nash, who is going to um, kick this off. Susie? Hi, good afternoon, welcome. Um, I'm Susie Nash, I'm the executive director here. I wanna tell you a little bit about what we do and how things work. We are a rehab hospital and center. 
basically what that means is that we take in orphaned and injured wildlife, Florida wildlife mostly, um, and treat them. And with the hopes of that we're going to release them. In our picture that you can probably see is Olga, one of our non-releasable great horned owls. Um, we see over 300 and 3,000, I'm sorry, animals a year. And that ranges from mice, sandhill cranes, foxes, possums, bunnies, you name it, we see it. Every so often we get a little fawn in, uh, we get turtles in every day, just every type of pretty much Western kind of Florida wildlife. Um, We've been working with the Harbor Ridge Security, Scott, and I think this is a great idea. And uh, we just thank you for getting involved in what we're doing. We're trying to do the best that we can to take care of our wildlife and also educate the community and the public on what to do for wildlife. So, so what are some of the things, Susie, that people can do if they find like an injured baby bird. I know that happens a lot for a lot of you. And you know, it's this baby, it's adorable. You don't know where the mother is. What are you gonna do? Each kind of bird specific. If you find a little dove, it depends on the size of them. It depends on if they're feathered. It, it depends on a lot. A lot of them are fledglings and coming out of the nest automatically. Um, it's important that the baby birds, if possible, and they're safe to stay with their parents. Birds learn their, their song from their parents. Basically, I believe it's the male one. And it's important to be able to leave these as much in their own habitat and with their family as possible. There's time they can't. They've been attacked by a cat. Um, there's animals around. That's when you bring them in. Uh, we have bunnies and rabbits. Um, well, or squirrels, sorry. The, the rabbits are the same way. Um, the mother does not take care of them very long. Once they're about the size of a tangerine, their eyes are open. Those little babies are on their own already. We see hundreds of them. We still take them in and we raise them for a couple more weeks and then release them uh, because that's what we do. And isn't it true that uh, the mother rabbit doesn't stay with her babies no, all day? No, she does not. She right. does not, mostly evening. And that's the interesting thing about deer. We get many phone calls like in between homes where they say there's a fawn in between my neighbor's house and mine, what do I do? The mother usually puts the fawns where she feels they're secure. If their ears are perked up and they're bright eyed, leave them there because once again, they only get fed early, early morning or in the evening. So you don't see the mom around, they're not orphaned. They're actually being taken care of by their parents and they're being put into a place where the parent thinks it's safe. What about if a turtle crosses the road, right? You're like, oh, I've heard some of these turtles bite. What should I do? Kind of an interesting thing. If the turtle's going to cross the road and you want to stop and help it, first be very careful with traffic, but if it's facing one way, going across the road, pick it up by the back end of the shell. Some of your soft shell turtles can be kind of vicious and they have very long necks. You pick it up in the very back of the shell to bring it across. If you happen to have a towel in your car, it's even better to just kind of pick it up with the towel and bring it across the road the way it's going. Most turtles are territorial and they're, they have maybe a several mile area that they live in all their lives. And they get very confused when people take them and set them elsewhere. Right, and so too, like, is there, Shouldn't people wash their hands if they touch the turtle too? Wash your hands after all the wild animals, not just turtles. But, you know, these animals can carry diseases. And we, we don't want to contact any of those diseases by thinking they're sweet and cute. And even a turtle carries different diseases. And it's always better after handling a wild animal to wash your hands. And what about, like, because sometimes, you know, just like, you and I, when, you know, when we're hurt, we are frantic, we aren't thinking clearly, uh, we're lashing out at someone trying to help us. I've done that a few times when I've tripped and fallen, you know, you're embarrassed. I'm sure a few animals out there have looked around and been like, I sure hope nobody stole that. But um, so 
what should someone do if it's like a bird of prey that has long talons? They're concerned that maybe it's going to be reactive. Best thing you do if it's a bird of prey and you have no experience with this is use animal control. Um, they will come, that we are contracted with them in the county, that they pick up all injured and orphaned wildlife and they bring it to us. And that's including opossums that might get hit on the road. Mostly all of us do in people stop, including animal control to make sure there's no babies in its couch. They're wonderful people, they help us a lot and do not hesitate to call them, even with a sandhill crane. Sandhill cranes are protected. Uh, they hurt their legs all the time, but if a bird can fly, it's almost impossible for anybody to catch it until it's grounded. Right, and so thinking about like what you guys can do as a community, um, we know that your head of security has been working really hard to come up with some protocol. And so we're gonna go ahead and uh, pass it back off to Mr. Scott Beatley to go ahead and talk about that with you all. Okay. Is, oh, I was just gonna say, Scott is our special guest today and we're so happy to have you here, Scott. Um, I'm finding that you are just an incredible resource to our community when it comes to wild animals and um, looking forward to you describing how we're starting to think about some of this. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to just say to all the members, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, one of the things that attracted me to this property was its beauty and the wildlife. Uh, it's amazing to me, the bobcat, the deer, um, the wild boar, et cetera, that we have here is, is just amazing. But I just wanted all the members to know that it is one of our primary responsibilities to respond to any kind of calls regarding wildlife, whether injured or in a position or a situation that makes you uncomfortable at your property. So call us first. Um, we'll respond to the home, obviously, assess the situation. And then like um, Susie said, we're pleased to have a resource other than just the county um, to rely upon to give us instructions or guidance on what to do with these animals or wildlife. Um, and I hope that God willing, once the pandemic is over with, we're gonna have Susie here to give us some training or some of my team members are gonna go to the facility to actually tour and learn things that we can do on our end to keep my staff safe and to keep the animals obviously safe and protected and properly handled. So again, it's my pleasure, thank you. And I look forward to seeing this thing grow and it's my pleasure to be here to serve, thank you. All righty, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Diatli, for helping your community with such an awesome thing. I mean, really, you guys are so lucky. So many communities in the area do not have um, a head of security who's so willing to help wildlife. Um, so I'm happy to introduce you guys to our clinic director, Ms. Cindy Dion. And she is here today with one of our uh, baby doves. And you can see here that she's starting to feed the dove. Um, so Cindy came to us um, as an intern originally for her wildlife biology degree uh, through Unity College in Maine. Uh, and through that experience, she got to come here and to our Hope Sound location, actually. That's where we previously were located. And gained a lot of knowledge and experience and was hired, actually, out of college. Um, and, you know, time passed on and she had another opportunity to go back to Maine, to her home state, and work for a zoo. So between now and then, she's come back to us and we're so grateful. The things that I've seen this woman do I'll call her up and I'll be like, Cindy, tell me what's going on. What awesome thing are you doing today? And um, so just the other day, she showed me that she was having a patient uh, turtle watch their favorite television show while they rehabilitated. So Cindy, go ahead and tell us a little bit more about what we do in the clinic. Hi guys. Uh, so basically anybody that comes into the clinic is uh, given a brief exam or a full exam 
possibly x-rays and or any type of treatments or medications that might be required um, for that particular case. Now we see everything from babies that are orphaned, baby birds, baby possums, baby squirrels, baby bunnies, to adult, even as you guys know, sandhill cranes, big pelicans, big eagles, anything. So we can go from tiny to as big as possible. So the best part about my job is that you never know what's coming through the door. It's always exciting. No day is the exact same. And I think that's why I love the most. Um, anybody in the clinic, you know, when you get an animal in, you get the history, you get where it was from, maybe what anybody saw, any type of history that you can gain will give you a little bit more of that mystery as to why this animal got injured. Now, if it's injured, you might see blood, you might see a break, you might see a drooping wing, you could see an open wound on a little baby bunny, maybe it was a cat attack, dog attack, or a wild animal attack, who knows? Well, and so... This year we were really fortunate through some great donations to get some awesome new medical equipment that we have never had before. So Cindy, tell us a little bit about some of the new upgrades we have. So having a microscope is one of the best things that you can have to make sure that you're screening for any type of parasites, not only for our protection, but also to help that animal. Because parasites will come with almost all animals, but sometimes it's secondary and that they're trying to break that animal down even if they are sick or injured the parasites can take over and become a nuisance and also, you know, continue to have that animal decline. So we can check for parasites, whether it's through a fecal analysis, a urinalysis, or even just um, doing a smear of some of their feces. We also acquired a x-ray machine, which is 100% amazing for a wildlife rehab center to have x-ray. And tell them how we were doing it beforehand. Um, by all, by palpation and just feeling and feeling for breaks. Um, we would have a vet also come out and try to help us out and assess, you know, how these animals, if there was an injury, but a lot of times you could see visually, um, or you could, you know, do a exam just by your feel. And that's really hard to tell how severe any type of injury is. So I use x-ray. I think I use it maybe 10 times today already. There's days that I use it not at all. Um, but it depends on how busy we are and what kind of animal comes in and what kind of injury they have. Um, and if it's necessary, if it's not necessary, then, you know, we treat accordingly. We also, um, what else did we get this year? Centrifuges. Um, so if we do, do need to collect any blood from any animals that we suspect are having, you know, a health crisis, um, especially any of the bigger animals that you can draw blood from them and without, um, how do you say, taking too much blood from a small animal is harmful to them. Yeah. So if you have a big enough animal and you can take a small amount, then you can get a better idea as a snapshot in time as to what's going on with that animal in a stressful situation, whether they're dehydrated, um, maybe they have organ failure, maybe they're fighting off a really bad infection. So you can tell a lot also by doing some blood work. And so, the anesthesia. And anesthesia. So we also, um, we had a little bit of outdated anesthesia machine and of course, for safety reasons, um, when you have an injured or broken animal, um, putting them under anesthesia is risky, but it also prevents them from getting injured any further and also reduces the stress of having that animal awake while you're trying to assess what's going on or doing x-rays or fixing a wound or flushing and cleaning and or suturing you know, up wound. So that makes a huge difference for the comfort of that animal. They don't even know um, when they're sedated and then when they wake up, everything's already done. So there's a lot of no hands-on in the sense. You're fine. Okay. Um, so some of the most important equipment in any veterinary hospital, but we're a wildlife facility. So we're grateful for the donations that we received and anybody that helped get us to that point of having anesthesia, full anesthesia, where you can do a full surgery. If we have the vets come out, they can do a full surgery on an animal um, or we can do it for minor procedures. And having an x-ray makes a huge difference just to be able to tell what is really going on internally and also what kind of a break are we dealing with? How quickly can we fix it? How easily is it fixable? Or is there no breaks at all? And it's just superficial. Uh, so that, that makes all, that makes my job easier. Right. And, you know, it's better for the patient. Absolutely. 
So why don't we go ahead and look at some more patients that we have currently. Okay. So we so, have a couple doves right now, yeah. right? So we got some morning doves. This, um, this, this is a ring neck dove actually. And so what we try to do when they come in, they're in the brooder, they're getting actually a milk kind of formula of, of bird. Um, formula. It's actually fed to them by a syringe in their crop. And once they start um, getting a little bit bigger, they don't any, they don't need to be in the brooder anymore. Um, they get their feathers on. We start training them how to eat. And if you guys see me, um, I start learning, like would come to them and regurgitate their food into their mouth. And so they do learn. It's a little trick we, we picked up. And so we offer it to them. And then any of the seed that falls on the ground, they'll eventually start pecking at it. We'll take the seed, you know, feeders away, and then they'll just learn how to eat on the ground like a normal dove. And then we'll get them in a, a bigger cage so that we can start testing their flight and get them, you know, more out in nature so they can survive and be aware of any of the weather that goes on out there, any of the predators that are out there. And then, then we would eventually release them. And how old, Cindy, would you say these two are? Oh, these guys grow real fast. Doves are probably one of the fastest growing. Um, this guy, oh, probably about, I'd say from birth to now, maybe about two months. This guy is just a little less behind, but he's also a different species. He's likely um, a ground dove. This is a ring neck dove. Oh, okay. All right. So, so who are we going to see next, Cindy? So we see a lot of, if, if nobody knows about screech owls, we have a species of owl in this area. That's a screech owl. It's very tiny. Um, you'll see one of them here. He's in the back. He's a little bit quiet, but these guys, they get hit by cars all the time. They come out right about, right when the time of day when it's just dark enough, but light enough that they can hunt for their prey. And they eat small insects, moths, small lizards. They go after a lot of the small prey. And what happens is they'll fly in front of a car and they didn't even realize it was coming and they get clipped and somebody will find them on the side of the road. So a lot of times these small little owls will have head trauma and Basically, what we can do is we can treat them accordingly and give them some time, give them some rest, quiet, and also feed them. And we will be able to tell if they're improving by how much they're eating, if they're taking the medicines well enough and responding to the medicine. So you do a brief exam every day on any of these patients that are basically in an ICU. Um, so anybody that's in here is under, you know, very strict watch and care. Anybody that gets outside, they're on the process of getting ready to go out to the wild again. They're fixed. They're able to go back into the elements, be able to get a bigger cage, and then be able to fly around. So that helps out a lot. And we have another screech owl. And sometimes with the event of having a screechy that gets hit, they can have some severe head trauma. And he's in the process of getting some treatment. Um, but neurologic problems can happen all the time. Um, from getting hit so hard by a car. So if you can imagine get, going up against a car and you're just a hundred gram little owl, sometimes they get hit in the head too bad. Um, and so we try to do some steroid treatment. We try to see how they respond and, and then hopefully we can get him back to health. And I have seen them gone from this bad and I know it looks really bad um, to going back to a hundred percent. So fingers crossed on this little guy, but we're on the process still having him uh, continue to heal. This guy did a little easier um, treatment. <clears throat> More exciting stuff happens over here. We got some bigger animals. Um, we do like to keep it quiet. Sometimes we'll turn the lights off as well um, so that we can keep you know, the noise down. We can also give a quiet, safe environment for them. This offspring came in maybe an hour ago. We try to operate. We've actually had fishermen out and say, because these are freshwater ospreys, that they'll actually catch a lot more mullet than they would any type of saltwater fish. So we have a variety that we can offer them. And the hardest part about having birds come in is that we hope they eat. We want them to eat, but if they're well enough, then that's when they, you see that they will start eating. And so, wouldn't you say that uh, osprey are the hardest bird to rehab? Yeah, we have a lot of them down here. Oh. I 
<laughs> You're freezing up on us a little bit, Carly. If they needed x-rays, if they needed any fluid. Or near, near a horse ranch. Um, so it was not right next to the road, which gives me a little bit of a clue as to maybe what happened to him. He may have bumped a tree. He might have fell from a tree. Um, he has a little bit of damage to one of his feet. And then the underside of his wing has a little bit of blood. But when I take an x-ray on him, there are no broken bones, which made my day. It really did make my day. Um, let's see. That. And haven't we had a record high of uh, ospreys that we rehabilitated this year? Yeah. So we, yeah. we're really, really doing good with ospreys. Really excited about that. So because they're one of the hardest, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you feel good about when you do finally have that species that's probably the most challenging, but then you can actually do, you know, see them fly off and they're doing great and they're hundred percent and they're going to be just fine. And that makes our day, honestly, it really, really does. We got a barred owl in here. Um, she has an eye injury. And we're going to be treating her eye. We'll have a vet come out and take a look at that eye and do a full exam, whether it's under anesthesia or not. She's a pretty good bird, but she is a barred owl. And she's pretty heavy for one of the bards. She's about, I feel like she's about 800 grams. So we're thinking she may be a female. But you can see that eye is a little cloudy. She's not closing it. She's protecting it a little bit more with that third eyelid and um, we'll get a chance to see how well she does. But a lot of eye injuries, those are important for owls um, to have fixed because they need that vision to be able to hunt and prey on their prey. Um, and then I'm, I'm gonna have to get out of the way for this one. This is a baby barn owl. He came into us with a fractured tibiotarsis, which is your lower leg, let's say. Hi, buddy. He jumped out of your nest, but he has a splint in place and you can confirm when you've done a splint um, by taking an x-ray, which again, I'm going to mention that word a lot. Um, basically with growing babies, you can fix their, their broken bones a lot easier than you can with an adult. Now we know with kids, they, you know, break their arm, they break their leg and they have cast on almost for a shorter period of time than adults. So we find that these babies can be healed faster and quicker and then rehabilitated and then released. Well, so Cindy, I, one of my favorite stories this year that I would love for you to share is the baby foxes that we had. Sure. That was exciting. So we had three baby foxes come in, two were perfectly healthy. And then we had this little runty one and he had a squinty eye. And of course you want to do a lot of hands off with a wild animal that can bite you and hurt you. Um, granted, they're little babies and they're cute and fuzzy, but they still wanna bite you. So this guy noticed his eye had a real issue and um, he had what we would call in the medical field is a, it's an ulcer of the surface of your eye. So there's a hole and there's a hole that's gonna possibly get the inside of your eye infected. And the most fascinating way to treat in veterinary medicine is to actually draw their blood, spin it down and use the serum of their own cells as eye drops to then heal that eye. That eye healed in maybe a week. The vet operated on it. The, the, vet, the vet took a look at it. Yeah. We saw improvement within one week of doing that type of therapy and all vets across the board. It sounds a little weird, but it is one of the best therapies that you can give over eye meds and you can do eye meds in addition, but that type of therapy using their own serum, their own cells to heal their own eye. It was fascinating. He was also released and, and did very well. And a lot of people I think would have probably thought that Fox was going to have to lose its eye or be blind. We did it first. You know, we, we, we had hopes that, you know, maybe we can save this eye when the vet took a look at it. It had an ulcer where some of the iris itself was protruding out of the hole of the ulcer on the lens. And so she did a minor surgery where she trimmed that area. Now, of course, when you're trimming anything, you know, you're, you're not covering it. You can't tell a fox, please don't scratch and touch your eye. You can't tell him to, you know, not 
not worry about that eye. So it was weepy, but we did treat it. Um, and usually eye meds, they are three times a day. So we had to put in the extra effort so that we could get him the best care. Um, and we did it and it worked out and I took pictures along the way. So I think back in our um, previous Facebook posts, we have some pictures of him, but he was pretty cool release. And speaking of extra effort, I think we forgot got to mention just how many times a day we have to feed our baby birds when they're in the brooder yeah oh every two oh, hours <laughs> every, every two, two hours, hours or less depending on your species if you have small little seed eaters you know you can maintain them when they're get, when they're bigger these guys are out of the brooder they're a lot bigger when you have small little babies they don't even have their eyes open you know it could be every 30 minutes so and we'll take a break come in the timer goes off you got to get those babies fed and you stop whatever you're doing out there and then you interrupt you know your stuff and you come in you feed those babies and you go back to whatever you're doing and aren't we lucky to have um someone who lives here full time right very lucky very yep. lucky because in the middle of the night you know if you take some of these babies home if as rehabbers were allowed to continue their care um at home if we deem that they need it and a lot of those babies need to be nursed, whether they're school, squirrels, bunnies, rabbits. Um, what happens is you have to continue that. And I don't want to drive home, come back two hours later, go home two hours later. So we found it's if you can keep them stress-free and those babies, they want to eat, that's what they do. But of course, we don't stay up all through the night because those birds go to sleep. Their parents would come back to the nest, sit on them, keep them warm, and they wouldn't feed them throughout the night. Unless we're talking about you know, the older, you know, birds that would require feedings throughout the night. If you're a bird of prey or an owl that would be eating during the nighttime hours. And so tell um, our group a little bit about like the partnerships, the important partnerships oh, we have in yeah. the community. So big, big shout out for animal control of Martin County. They, they are the ones that will bring us the majority of the animals that we see over 3000 animals a year. I mean, that's a lot of animals to see. So they get calls and calls and calls, but they can be the ones that go out. They're always out there. They're near the beach. They're near your neighborhoods. They are out there. They bring those animals to us. And those girls are amazing. They'll jump out in the ocean to go get a pelican with a fishing line on it. You know, they will go the extra mile. They'll get ducklings out of a, um, you know, a sewer well because they hear them down there. They'll do that for cats and dogs too. Don't, don't get me wrong, but we're so grateful to them. We also have um, a relationship with um, some of the laboratories in this area that are doing um, studies such as um, tick studies so that we can study any type of parasites that might be carrying additional diseases um, in this immediate area. So if I get an armadillo and he has a bunch of ticks all over him, I can call the state and say, hey, you know, I'm going to get you 10 ticks. Can you test them for any of these diseases that may not be common in this area and they're becoming an invasive species or an invasive um, virus or disease that's being passed in this area. So we can give them a heads up. We also have, um, what are the other ones? Um, it's a rabbit disease too. That's oh, yeah. So you can talk about that one. No, no, I don't really know the name of it. I can't remember it. It's There's a, a new disease. Respiratory disease. That <laughs> started in Texas and- You it froze up on us again, Carly. How are we doing? Can you hear us? Good? That's better. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Probably all this back and forth here, but Susie's going to tell us like how we have, basically we're studying all these diseases and tracking them to help the government um, make sure that we're not getting any new introductions um, that could be potentially harmful. Um, so, Cindy, why don't we head outside yeah. to the weathering yard? Okay. Cool birds. So, tell us a little bit about what the weathering yard is. So, by having a bunch of animals come to us, and sometimes they're broken, um, what we can do is if it's a species that we think could become an ambassador animal, and an ambassador animal to us can be an education animal. We have permits that we hold that we're allowed to be able to display them for education pur purposes, use them to go out on programs, um, do shows. Um, and these guys are probably our highest attraction. 
when it comes to coming out to see our facility. Um, we bring them out every day. They probably get the best care of all the animals because they get to go on trips and get to go see the world out there. Uh, but we use them so that people can see them up close and be able to identify better you know, what they're looking at. They might just say, oh, I think that's an owl. But then they can actually learn what kind of an owl it is. Um, so we have not only a male great horned owl, this is Artie. He is a younger one that had a previous wing injury that deemed him permanent. And he came to us as a transfer in. No, he no, was, was a baby that oh, baby. fell out of the nest with a, a necrotic wing. It was about falling off. And he, was, oh, he was still Artie. had his little white fuzzy furry feathers on him. And who else do we have? We, we have, have Miss Grace. She is a 23 year old bald eagle. She also fell out of the nest, broke both of her elbows. And she has some mature cataracts going on now at her age. And she has some arthritis in her feet, but she still enjoys coming out and being an ambassador bird. Um, she is small for a female, but she has not only the cataracts, she has a left wing injury. Um, so we will still let her live out her forever life with us. Um, I don't know if you guys remember seeing Miss Olga. She is a female great horned owl and they are more aggressive um, on the scale of the owls. The females are always bigger in the birds of prey and she was a transfer from Miami. Miami. The, the place was closing down. They were gonna euthanize her and we took her. And so she wouldn't be euthanized. She's a beautiful bird. She's a wonderful bird. They can also second as being a surrogate mom if we get baby owls in. Um, if we get baby great horns in, we can take her anklets off and put her in a private suite and have her start raising and teaching those babies the proper way to rip open prey and then also to learn how to fl have flight and their, their call. All right, who else? Uh, we have Cabo. This is a female crested caracara. Now, now a lot of people recognize this bird, let's say in the Western area of the state. Um, we do have them over here on the East Coast as well, but they tend to uh, frequent the West Coast, Lake Okeechobee and any of the cow fields in the area. Um, they eat lizards, crickets, snakes, anything that your typical hawks aren't going to be looking for. They're very aggressive when it comes to um, finding their prey and catching their prey. Cool. We what else do you want to see? That's how our time is. We have a, a red-tailed male. This is Hercules. He has a right wing injury that is a permanent break. Very cool. We yes. have Henry. He is a sharp chin hawk. He has he had cancer on some of his toes that had to be amputated, so he no longer could be in the wild to hunt properly. This is a barred owl. Her name is Leela. She is a full mature female and she only has one eye. And she came to us like that. So with birds of prey for their depth perception when they're hunting, they have to have both eyes in order for them to be a releasable bird. Hi, buddy. So this is, tell us about this osprey. Okay, so as you know, we get a lot of ospreys in. Come on over here, buddy. We get a lot of ospreys in. And with this guy, um, he had a broken bone in his left wing. And we were hoping that it would heal up, but it actually did not heal as well as possible. So. With an osprey, as you know, they have to have flight. They can't fly and catch a fish and actually dip into the water, catch that fish and lift out of the water with that heavy fish. They are not deemed releasable. And he took really well when handling him and took to a glove. So we tried him out as an education ambassador bird and he's actually doing a lot better than we expected. He's, he's one of my favorites. We will be putting something on Facebook too. Too, we know oh, he's a we male. Need a name. We, right, we tested him. We know he's a male to figure out a name for him. So that probably in the next week or two, 
will be going on Facebook. So people can give us some really good suggestions for names. You have a red tailed female. She has a left wing injury and she also is blind in one of her eyes. And then right behind you is Maxine. She also has an eye injury. She is a red shouldered hawk. They're very common down here and very vocal. Cool. Well, why don't we take a tour out back? Sure. So tell us what we'll have back here. So we have some birds back here that are actually waiting for some permanent cages to be put on display. Um, sometimes we get these owls that can't be ambassador animals, um, but we feel that they're living stress-free in captivity and then they could also be used for display. This way. So what do we have right here? This is the housing that will be upgraded hopefully soon with some donations um, for the birds of prey um, that they go into at night. They're their little sweets. It is aged, it's 15 years old. Let's go ahead and walk in here. So what is this called again, Cindy? It's called a mew and it's a, a small housing development for um, birds that are trained and have hardware on them, such as your jesses, your anklets. And the birds, if they have that hardware on them, they should not be in a cage because they could hurt themselves if it were any bigger. Um, so we have small cages for them, but it will um, hopefully soon get an upgrade and they will all get a better looking home. Well, don't we have some new upgrades around the corner? We do today. Yes, please excuse the mess. Yeah. Um, so we have done some really good fundraising. And as soon as we get any money that we have done for any fundraising or donations or significant donations, what we end up doing is putting it right out there. We're pulling foundations for new cages that are going to be updated to the highest standards. And they're just finishing up pouring some of the foundations itself. Yeah, so weren't we having problems with flooding when we had the uh, high rain event this year? Yeah. We always have problems with flooding. We sure do. This so. ground is very low. This will help with that. Yep. And moving with the new mews, we'll be able to move them to a different area of the property so that they're high and dry. Plus making it a hurricane safe facility to where we don't have to move all the birds. Plus we can put other birds and animals in there also. Right, so, so making making more room for more patients to be rehabbed. Correct, Absolutely. and that will also be that. So we have two barred owls that will be permanent and they will be on display if we can raise enough money to build a barn. And we'll show you that shortly. And then two pelicans that will be released back to the wild tomorrow. Um, both of them had fishing line and fishing hooks stuck in their beak and wrapped around either the leg or the wing. Um, and that's pretty common. We see that a lot, but they're doing just fine. They both ate very well and they didn't come from the same area, but they do, they're a very social bird to each other. So they get along. My favorite as of this week yeah. is a juvenile bald eagle. Yeah, you can know, uh, oh, no, I left my keys out back. I have to, I might have to go through this, sorry, I left my keys. That's all right. Tell us about this cool bird. So, what do we got here? This was a transfer from another wildlife rehab place that doesn't typically do um, bigger birds of prey. They do more mammals and um, turtles. So they gave us a call and we look at split, got a plan to run up there, pick up this bird. What is this bird? So this bird is a juvenile bald eagle, likely one and a half to two years old. And you can look up their markings and try to identify how old they are. All these eagles are having babies right now. So likely this guy's about closer to two years old. His eyes haven't changed. So he's not at the two and a half year mark, um, but she's massive. I think it's a female. We're not gonna sex her. We don't even wanna have a lot of hands on with her, but we have fixed her as best we can. She was having some likely head trauma from an injury like a hit by car. Um, she may have even had hypothermia the night we had like 38 degrees down here, it was freezing. 
she was found cold, wet, and dropped off in their drop-off bin. And after that, having her, you know, look and perch and fly around in this cage, this is a smaller cage for her, but we prefer that for right now until we can make sure that she's not gonna hurt herself by trying to fly and then falling on her back, which she was having some neurologic issues. She, we also have a mature bald eagle. Um, a mature bald eagle, his name is Golf Ball. And if you guys don't know our famous story about how Golf Ball came to us, he was literally hit with a golf ball on the course. Bad timing for that poor golfer. That golfer scooped him up and brought him to us. And that wing actually had such a severe break from the impact of that golf ball. He decided to name him a golf ball, but he had that amputated. He does very well um, here with us and he shares another cage that's being upgraded with a foundation. So they're in this temporary rehabilitation cage that um, we typically use to help test fly some of our birds before they get released. Um, he shares a cage with a turkey vulture that has another entry on his wing and another caracara that, well, I don't think, it's, I think it's a male. Yeah, we never um, sexed it. Yep. But they, they have this relationship that uh, to me is amazing. They do come in contact with each other out in the wild. Um, but we found that these guys actually get along very well. They all, they will all perch on the same perch, which They're is- They're buddies. Yeah, they, they get along very well. They're buddies. <clears throat> well, so let's go ahead and uh, see our sulcatas. Yes. So tell us a little bit about like how we happen to have non-native uh, yeah. animals in our yeah. care. So oh and we might have to make this a quick trip because we have the cement mixer yay we're very to the excited left, to the left here is the normal pelican cage we have nine permanents we have a new watering trough for them they're building a base for it and we had all these telephone poles to help secure it because of hurricanes the same thing is happening on the 24 behind that that's usually where golf ball and the Caracara and the Vulture live. So we've had to move everything away so that these wonderful men, Accurate Concrete, they've been doing great for us and have given us a lot of time and effort in making it right so we can make sure that these animals are secure. Yeah, and I've heard that we might have a big hurricane season. <laughs> which... That's scary. The most scary thing that is the news. I was say, because so what happens when we have a hurricane? What do we have to do with all these animals? They come inside the house, inside the, you know, our, our, our clinic. Um, some of them are taken home. You know, we have to put them inside carriers. That includes the little alligators and the crocodile and Everything. all of the other stuff. Everything has to go into a more secure area. All right, so I guess our sulcatas are in for the night, right? Yeah, they go in for their heated enclosure. Now, African sulcatas are African of nature. They should not be in this, in this concrete, um, but people can buy them at the pet stores. So people go and buy a little turtle. They love them. They think they're cute and then they start outgrowing their little aquarium. Then they get too big for their aquarium, so they pass them off to somebody else. Now, some, some turtles, some species can live 40, 50, 60, 70 years. You know, your sea turtles live hundreds of years. So that's when a lot of people will have to actually, you know, pass them on. We acquired the two because of course, same situation. Um, and they've lived with us now for over 25 years, I believe. They've gone from the bridge load location to this location. And then hopefully someday we will get the, their enclosure also upgraded. Awesome. Well, why don't we wrap up here? Okay. Um, and we'll let Susie tell us a little bit more about the future while we hang out with some of our friends. Go back over to Olga. Oh, it is. Or, or, yeah, Olga. All right, cool. Hi, Miss. Hi. So as you can all see and hear as we're trying to really do some upgrades 
to make this more secure, uh, healthier, better place for all our animals. Part of that is the new muse, which we just took the walk into. I'm not sure that's gonna su survive a hurricane. And um, it worries me terribly, but we can make the animals safe. But that's one of my goals this year, which along with repairing the cages and stuff. Um, we have 293 acres here. On those 293 acres, we have 140 of them that are wetlands. The wetlands are kind of run by the USGA, but it's the most beautiful, pristine Florida property that you ever see. Wetlands, oak hammocks, just a pine hammocks, they're just gorgeous. Um, we're getting ready to look for funding for a new nature center. Um, on the property that's part of ours, on the other 20 acres on the side of the hospital, we're going to be building a 5,000 square foot nature center. This nature center will do several things. We want to do a lot of education. We want to be able to have summer camps for children to teach them about nature, to teach them about the outside. Um, we also like to rent it out for different functions to people. So we actually, as a nonprofit, have money coming in here. Um, at that time, once we get that built up, we'll be able to work on the nature trails that we want around it. So our permanents, like our screech owls, um, like golf ball that you met, will be in a more natural habitat, one they're more comfortable in, and one where people can walk around and see them. Um, you know, dedicated spaces for the, the animals is great. And and you are planning on making a barn owl? A, oh, yes. A, we did. It was too noisy out there yeah. to show you. We have an old horse barn. We have a, a roofer in town that has is donating his roofing materials and time to put a new roof on it. But one of the things that we're going to do is be making that to be our owl barn. And so we already have a, a no, we know a baby bar now, the great horns and the bards will be in there. So when you come to visit us, you'll be able to see all of the owls we have. The same thing with the turtle enclosure. We have the sulcatas out there, but we also have a gopher tortoise and we have just regular non-water turtles that people will be able to look at. Um, so that's our future. Uh, I think it's bright and I thank you all so much for everything you've done with us. Um, donations are always wonderful. If you ever want a private tour, anything like that, any of you, please call us and we'll walk you around. We'll take these birds out, put them on our arms, you know, your arm, your, our arms. So so that, on us again. So that we can do that. But we thank you all for your time for your donations. What you're doing is great. Partnering with y'all, I think is wonderful. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. This place is gonna be amazing when we get done with it. And it's gonna be people like you that help us get to where we need to be. And thank so you. tell them about, don't we have some events coming up? Oh yes, March the 13th, we're having an open house. We have a band. Um, live band, the doctor band coming. We have the sheriff's girl team coming. And this is just a brand new patient from Animal Control. We just told you about those ladies, how wonderful they are. And she's going to be examining that. Yeah, I just, they want to poke your eye out. So we want to make sure we keep our distance. This is a brand new patient. Brand new, brought in by Miss Kimmy from Animal Control Martin County, which I talked to about earlier. But this is basically how our day goes all the time. Um, so this bird, I believe a call came in. We sent Animal Control out. It was somewhere on the side of the road. He was actually in a marsh, stuck, could not get up. Yeah, so his legs are not functioning, it looks like. Um, he's bright alert and you can see, but he's soaking wet. He has no waterproofing to him. Um, and I'm gonna do a brief exam and it's up to you guys if you want to watch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or you can ask questions while we're doing this. We can talk and work. Yep. I think so. that that's where we're at time-wise. So Lois, um, we're happy to take questions while Cindy um, helps this injured animal. 
That's great. Does anybody have a question? Just hit your space bar if you want to speak. Where are they um, located? What's their address? Our address is 8626 Southwest Citrus Boulevard in Palm City. We're exactly four miles from the 714 Citrus Boulevard light, light, right where the Palm City produce is. And what are our visitor hours? Our visitor hours are usually Thursday through Sunday from 11 to three. Um, we're open seven days of work for patients and we have an after hours drop off. Animal control also um, is able to access because we're closed now um, to come in here so that the animals can be taken care of. We're gonna warm him up. Yeah, he's got some wear from the other questions. area. So it was at this point that we were planning to go ahead and um, wrap up and talk about raffle winners, but does everybody want to stay on and see what's happening with this heron? Yes, definitely. Yeah. That's a great idea. So what we're doing right now um, is we're getting some warm towels for this bird. Um, we're also making sure that we're really safe with the crane. Um, a lot of them uh, will try and use their beaks to, um, you know, defend themselves. They're never been used to uh, being handled by uh, humans. Um, like the animal control officer was saying, um, the leg was not functioning. So we are going to be um, palpating everything that's um, there to see what doesn't seem to be working. Do you know how long they spotted them there? And where was this crane found? Um, off Salvatore Road. Okay, so Stewart. in Stewart. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's a great blue heron. Yes. It's a great blue heron. Now, is there anything common, Cindy, that herons suffer from that this crane could be suffering from? Um, so we sometimes will see a lot of um, either poisoning, lead poisoning, poisoning, any type of toxins um, in the environment, any type of, um, I cut, I'd say like bad fish, they ate something um, in the environment that's rotting or rotten. Uh, so you can even get botulism that's seen in ducks from eating rotten vegetation that's actually just decomposing. Um, but this guy looks a little bit more um, weak. He's not showing neuroscience in his eyes or his face, but he's freezing cold. So he may be going into hypothermia. So what I want to do is warm him up the fastest and then I'll do a, a little bit more of an exam later. He may have been in that water for the whole night. And then with the wear on his breast, his heel, and some of where we can see his feathers are just not waterproof. So he's he's in bad shape. And the first thing to do is try to stabilize this animal. I might give him some fluids, but really the heat is most important for them. They can't process food, even when they're at a temperature that's lower um, than what is normal for them. And their normal temperature is between 102 and 104. Um, so a lot higher than what we would think is normal. So they're freezing cold. Um, and so I had my boss warm up some warm towels in the dryer, which is kind of the quickest way to get some heat provided to them. We can also put some heating, heating pads under a layer of blankets so that it's providing constant warmth. Um, but right now he requires some warmth and um, that's some fluids and rest. And then Susie, I don't know if I heard you say this, but what if people want to like take um, an active role and come volunteer with us? Do we have availability? We love volunteers, yes. And even with COVID going on, as you can see, is walking around. It's very open. Uh, we have volunteers come every single day, but I, I would love to have volunteers to do yard work, 
I love we have construction construction if anybody has any of that knowledge and know how and wants to help go what about Al barn or anything like that it would be great what about some tours could people maybe do some like education yeah. if they're good at talking to people yeah yeah we can do that plus once we get it straightened up a little bit we have a pond where we can do actually a nature walk with a naturalist um explaining different things like pine trees having male and female parts you know that you can take the new part of that and boil it up and make a tea out of it so we're also planning on these different nature walks and things that you do but if you're volunteers oh and the astronomy thing I want to have an astronomy night. If any of you have any experience of that in telescopes, that would be a wonderful thing. We're so dark out here and we have this huge field that we would really like to do some, maybe night birds, um, looking at the stars, different things like that. So there's all different ways to volunteer. So it seems like we're gonna have a moment where Cindy is gonna be working um, hard to save this heron. So um, let us uh, know if you guys want to wrap up and ask any more questions. Because I know you guys have that awesome raffle going on. That bracelet, guys, anybody who wins the bracelet, Carly <laughs> wants it. So it sounds like it might be time to um, wrap things up here and let you guys do the work that you need to do but we are so appreciative that we have been able to get a little insight into what goes on there. Um, what you do is amazing and obviously it takes a lot of knowledge, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of funding. So um, we're glad that we can provide a little bit of help in that department. And we appreciate um, it, we really do. Yeah, so let me take a moment and just share um, raffle winners because I we have some people with us here today who won some prizes. So I'm going to take a moment and share my screen. All right. Um, so. Without further ado, first I want to say thank you so much to everybody who um, made donations um, of raffle prizes. We had some amazing things and obviously that's what it takes to have a successful raffle. So um, the winner of the sterling silver bracelet donated by Jet Jatlo is Meryl Leteplo. I think Maya is going to have a good Valentine's Day. The floral oil painting by our very talented Pat Hoshino was won by Betty Lacey. The guided tour of Wakota Hatchie wetlands um, donated by Mike Henderson and guided by Mike Henderson goes to Sue Hesh. The great blue heron in flight photographed and donated by Harry Harrison goes to Jean Vitalis. Learn to take better photos with Lois Fraser. <laughs> That goes to Joanne Harris. This amazing bird themed gift basket with all kinds of really fun stuff in it goes to Meg Mithoffer, donated by Marcia Seta. The breeding great blue, uh, breeding great egret rather with um, great blue heron photographed and donated by Susan Menson goes to Els Walker. An interior design consultation donated by Ginny Salome goes to Chris Kaufman. The Sunbird Scarf by Melissa Gru, uh, amazing photographer who spoke to the birders a couple of years ago, donated by Anita and Gordon Lamb goes to Sue Hesch. The metal print of a tricolored heron goes to Jill Kelly. The contemporary sculpture called Pink Grotto, donated by Carl Schlanger, goes to Ginny Miller. The golf lesson, which was a very popular thing, so apparently we all need help with this, <laughs> from an anonymous donor goes to Deborah Roundtree. Sandhill Crane Sweetness, a beautiful photo uh, and beautifully framed by Sue Hesch, goes to Cheryl Hatfield. And the most popular prize of all, the wildlife experience donated by the Treasure Coast Wildlife Center goes to Marsha Seta. So um, 
in total, thanks to everybody's purchases of raffle tickets and donations, we've raised um, $7,040. That's not a final number because we're gonna um, leave our site open for donations for a while uh, in case people were feeling inspired by what they saw today. And I think there are probably some people who couldn't attend that might wanna still donate. Um, so we'll make sure everybody has that link. But um, I think we have seen how, um, they really need and make good use of every penny that they can get at the Treasure Coast Wildlife Center. And they have a great vision for the future and anything that we can do to support that, I think we can all feel really good about. So at this point, I just wanna say thank you so much to Treasure Coast Wildlife Center. That was above and beyond all expectations. That was just a wonderful tour. Um, and I guess I'll ask, is there anything left to see with the great blue heron that came in for anybody who wants to stay on longer or should we just wrap up? I would probably say wrap up. So he needs to oh. warm up um, oh. before I really mess with him. Um, typically you don't want to send that bird into more shock. Um, if he's dealing with shock right now from being in the environment, he's freezing cold. Um, I'm really just going to be dryers you know the dryers go in with warm towels and then I switch them out so that's the first process of trying to help this bird um, giving fluids to him I just want to see how he does if he can warm up at all um, but I'll give him some sub-q fluids because I don't know when the last time he had a meal was so that will help get him through the night and then tomorrow hopefully with some medications tonight and sub-q fluids um, we'll hopefully see a little bit of improvement and um, then maybe see a continued story on that. Maybe we'll try to give you guys some updates. We would um, love to have an update. And it's been so interesting to have insight into what it takes to rescue these animals. Um, so thank you again so much. We, we all appreciate it. And we look forward to coming. We really appreciate thank you. it for everything you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good luck with the hearing. Thank you.